Now, we're really excited to begin a new series, a preaching series today. And this series is going to take us from today right through to the very end, pretty well the very end of the year. It's called Devoted. You see it up on the, on the screen there. I'll just go. And it's called Devoted Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. And that's what we really want to get across to you through this series. The series takes us through Acts. Today we'll be going through Acts chapter 1, and then next week will be Acts chapter 2, and we'll slowly work our way through the entire book of Acts, so at the end of the year you can look back and say, wow, we've covered an entire book in our preaching, and we've learnt from the stories and all the things that are in, can, contained in the book of Acts. Now one of the reasons that we chose the book of Acts is this year we are establishing and we're setting a new vision for the Kingscliff Seventh-day Adventist Church. And what better place to begin that journey of, of coming up with a vision than looking back to where it all began, where the Christian church began, and looking at, at the, the passion and the mission and the vision that God had given to his first disciples and apostles and the first Christians um, of the Christian church to learn what God's purpose and will is for us in our life today. So that's why we're going through the book of Acts. Now, Devoted. What does that word mean? Any ideas? Devoted. Yell, yell something out if you can think of what devoted. Faithful. Faithful. Okay, I like that. Faithful. Anything else? Loyal. Dedicated. Anything else? I love all those. Connected. Or committed. I love those things. I think devoted, a word that would really summarize devoted would be com Committed. It involves dedication, it involves loyalty, and it involves persistence at whatever it is that you're doing. An example of devotion, I have a friend at college, and when I was at college the last um, few years, and I remember walking across the grounds at college, and I see my friend just like charging along running, and he was just, looked like he'd been, I don't know how, how far he'd been running, but it looked like he'd gone a long way, because he looked dehydrated, he was sweating, he was in this like triathlon suit, running around the college campus, and I was like, whoa, what have you been doing? And it turns out he was preparing for a half Ironman. Okay, now, um, several months later, he went and did that half Ironman, and it was in Port Macquarie, where I'm from, so I took him to, to the event. And I remember when, it was really funny, because when we got to Port Macquarie, we'd just driven from college the three hours up to Port Macquarie, and he goes, oh, I've forgotten my shoes. Okay, so that was the first thing he'd forgotten. And then later on, I realized that the bike that he had, he was, he'd borrowed his wheels from someone else. And when it goes to the swimming, he was one of the, like, probably two or three people that didn't have a wetsuit. So it was like a freezing cold day. And so he just did it tough. And so I went down there at 6 a.m. in the morning, dropped him off, watched him start, went home, spent the whole day at home. And then at the end of the day, I went, all right, let's watch him go and cross the finishing line. And so I go back there, and so he has been just going at it for the entire day. And I get there, and he just, at the end, he just looked way worse than he's looked at college. But he was stumbling across, and he makes it across that line, and he'd finished. For me, that is a good example of what devotion is. Devotion is enduring for the cause, no matter what it, whatever it takes. Whatever obstacles, whether you forget your shoes, and you have to run in my dad's shoes, that's what he was running in. Never worn them before. I have to run 20 kilometers in them. That's devotion. And some people might even know who that is. He was, he was um, who I'm talking about. Now, the disciples, they were devoted people. And they overcame all sorts of obstacles. They faced threats and dangers. They were persecuted and arrested. They were falsely accused, imprisoned. imprisoned. They were pl uh, plotted against in the secret. They were um, abused by rioting crowds in the public. They were looked upon as troublemakers and heretics. They were beaten, they were stoned, and they were killed. And this, when you read these stories, it really shows that like, the devotion that my friend has is nothing compared to the devotion of the early Christians. And the thing is, the, the early Christians, they weren't devoted so much to a cause, but they were devoted to a person. And it was that devotion that allowed them to, to, go, to um, persist through all those obstacles that came in their way. I've got it for you on a, a verse on the screen in Acts chapter 20. And throughout this sermon, you're going to have a few little snapshots. This is really an 
introductory sermon to Acts, and there'll be a few little snapshots of what some of the things we're going to cover. And I love the picture of devotion that we see at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And we're going to unpack this throughout the series. And it says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warned, warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So here we see Paul, and someone had actually told him by the Spirit of God that he is going to be bound and have a terrible time in Jerusalem. But he's saying that in every place he goes, the Spirit warns him that prison and hardships are facing me. But he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Is that a picture of devotion? And so our prayer as the pastoral team, as we unpack this series chapter by chapter, is that we might begin to get a picture of, firstly, of Jesus' devotion to us, and then the devotion that, this, that the disciples had for Jesus, and that we might become people of the same sort of devotion in our day-to-day lives. So let's have a prayer, and then we'll dig into chapter 1. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we can call you Father. Um, we're unpacking that this morning in the Sabbath school groups. Lord, you love us and you care for us and you are so devoted to us, so devoted to us that you went to the cross. And Lord, I pray that as we we go through this series that you would um, reveal insights to us, reveal the, the, the hidden treasures in your scriptures and may at the end of this we be more devoted, more committed, more loyal, more persistent um, followers of you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. The structure of the sermon today, and all the sermons will have a similar sort of structure, there's two main components. The first part will be learning it. So this is where we'll be looking directly at the, at the text. We won't be bringing our own ideas and um, things that we want to sh- say, but we really, really want to just unpack the text and what is the text actually saying? What did the text mean to the original people who read it? And when we unpack what the text in its original context meant, we're then going to take the next step from learning it to living it. And so the first part of the, of the sermon, we'll unpack five words, and these are Acts, Gospel, Mission, Spirit, and Elijah. And that will, those five words will, I guess, encapsulate the main ideas in the learning it section, and then when we go through that, we're going to say, how do we apply this to our lives? How do we live this this out. So let's pick it up in chapter 1 and verse 1. Okay? It says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, one of the first things you'll notice when you look at that first verse is in the first book. What is that telling you about this book? It tells you that it's the second book. Okay. So some people think that Acts is just a standalone book, but in fact, Acts is the second in the series. It's the second book, and it's written to a man by the name of Theophilus. So the question is, what is the first book in the series? Where do we find this? And we find this... And we find a clue, and it shows us what the first one is, when we look at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Beginning of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. In other words, there's been many people who have tried to give an account, write down, gather together the stories of Jesus. But then it goes on to say, With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, this is Luke, he had researched, he had asked people, he had talked with the people who were eyewitnesses, since he had carefully investigated and researched the whole story of Jesus, from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So here we see that Luke is part one in this two-part series. And the purpose of it is for Luke 
to, he's writing this, this book to Theophilus, and it's an orderly account. It's, it's a thorough research account of the story of Jesus. Now, we don't really know who Theophilus was, but he must have been someone of standing, someone of importance, because it says, most excellent Theophilus. And the purpose is so that he may know for certainty the things about Jesus. And so the purpose of both Luke and of Acts, which we're going to get to um, today and the rest of this, this year, is the purpose of it is to reveal the things of Je- about Jesus, the stories of Jesus, the stories of, and, and to um, bring about inside of us a belief and a faith and a trust in those things, in those stories, in ultimately the person of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're going. That's, that's part one. So Luke is the part one and Acts is part two. So who was Luke? Luke was a Gentile, and we know this because in one of Paul's letters to the Colossians, he gives a list of all the Jews, and then he lists the people who aren't Jews, and Luke, the physician, is one of those people. So Luke is a Gentile, and an interesting fact is that if Luke's a Gentile, that makes him the only Gentile author in the whole of the Bible. And in fact, if you add up the the amount of words in, in Luke and Acts... It, it, we discover that Luke is actually the most preli- um, wrote more in the New Testament than any, than any other author, even Paul. So Paul wrote more books, but if you add up all the words in Luke and Acts, Luke is the, the great, the most prolific, um, prolific, that's the word, writer in the New Testament. Now, another thing about Luke was he was a compa- companion of Paul. He went along on, with Paul on sections of his second missionary journey, second, sections of his third missionary journey, and, on his, and also on his final journey to Rome. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9 to 11, here we have Paul, and he's, this is the last letter that Paul wrote, and he's basically approaching his death. And he's writing about all these people who have abandoned him. This is in Rome, and he says, do your best, so he's talking to Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And get Mark and bring him with, with you because he's helpful to me as well in ministry. So Luke was a loyal, devoted person himself. When, when um, in this part of Paul's life, he's in Rome, everyone else has deserted him. But Luke was the one who stuck by his side. And this is how Luke has such an intimate knowledge of, especially the, the, the situations of Paul, and because he was actually there for a lot of them. And so we're going we're to learn this as we unpack this, this book. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read verse 1 again. And this is going to bring about our first major point of, of this chapter. It says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. Now, the first point is a subtle point, and it's easy to miss it, okay? But let's, when you look at that closely, it says, the first book's all about Jesus, dealt with what Jesus began to do and teach until the resurrection. What is the implication of that statement? If the first book is about all that Jesus began, did and taught up to the resurrection, what is the second book about? The second book is about all that Jesus did and taught post-resurrection. Now this is a a really important point because we often call it the Acts of the Apostles. But the reality is this, that it's actually the Acts of Jesus. And so Luke is the Acts and the Teachings of Jesus Part 1, and um, Acts, oh, sorry, yeah, Luke is, and Acts is Acts in the teaching of Jesus, part two. When we read through this, Jesus, the story of Jesus doesn't fade into the background. It's not like the cross is just getting further and further away, and Jesus becomes a person of the past. Instead, in the book of Acts, Jesus is front and center. He is on the, the center stage, and, and the things that are happening in the church is really Jesus at work by his spirit through the church. And so when we read through this, we see that this is not... Um, a story just about the apostles, but this is the life and teaching of Jesus post-resurrection by his Holy Spirit through his apostles. That's point number one. So Acts, the Acts and teaching of Jesus, part two. That's what the, that's what the book is. Now the second one is gospel, okay? 
Now, often we don't realize how shattered the, God, the disciples would have been when Jesus died upon the cross. They had in their mind this, this picture of the Messiah as coming and overthrowing the Romans, who had oppressed them for so long, and establishing an earthly, um, temporary sort of a, a kingdom. And they were waiting for Jesus to, to start some sort of riot or some sort of war to overthrow um, the Romans. But when Jesus was arrested, crucified on the cross, can you imagine how disappointed they would have been? All their hopes, all of their, um, all of their life really was tied up in this, this leader, this Messiah who was going to establish his kingdom, and then he's killed upon the cross. This would have absolutely shattered the disciples. And when we read in, in chapter... Um, True, we see something really interesting about when Jesus was resurrected and he, and he came back to the disciples. It says, sorry, in verse 3, it says, He presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus had to prove to them that he was alive. Do we, we often don't sort of realize that, I don't think. When Jesus came back, he appeared to them over 40 days saying, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. And for some of the disciples, they were pretty pretty slow. When the women, and this is taking back, this is really summarizing chapter 24 in Luke, part one of the Acts of Jesus. The first people saw Jesus after his resurrection with the women. He went there, and they were told by the angel that Jesus has risen, and they were so excited. They went back to the, the apostles, and they, it says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Okay? Remember, Jesus had told them that he was going to die and be raised from the dead, but when they got reports that Jesus had actually raised from the dead. They said, that just seems like nonsense. And then Peter, he says, I'm going to go check this out for myself. And he rushes to the tomb, and it says, he got up, ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and says he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Okay? Is it kind of obvious? He sees there, there's no Jesus in the tomb. The, the grave clothes are there, are there, like folded up nicely. And Peter's there, wonder what happened here. Was he slow? He was incredibly slow. And so we see in Acts chapter 3 that Jesus had to prove to the disciples. He had to prove to them. And if you continue to read through the... um, We'll probably skip through that one. But it talks about when Jesus met with them during those 40 days, he opened the scriptures to them. He showed them how he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament, how the Old Testament pointed to his suffering. I'm sure he told, talked to them about the lamb. And because they knew about the lamb, they went to the temple um, over and over and over, and they sacrificed his lamb. And Jesus would have told them that, that the lamb represented him upon the cross, and he, how he was going to come and he was going to die for their sins. He would have told them about how, um, how it was necessary and how he was doing this so they may have forgiveness of their sins. And, and all they would need to do is believe and trust in what Jesus did upon the cross for their salvation and for their forgiveness. And so, as they're there, they're, they're listening to Jesus, and I can just imagine these like light bulbs flashing. Oh, it makes sense now. Oh, it makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense. And these people who were once skeptical about this whole resurrection of Jesus, they started to realize the beauty and the incredible nature of the gospel. And they realized that Jesus, even though he had died upon the cross, was alive, and he was there to continue working through them and to reveal, take the good news of the gospel, of salvation, of forgiveness, of a brand new start, and of a future hope of the kingdom being established of the whole world once again to the ends of the earth. And so it was the understanding of the gospel that really drove them. Now let's go on to the point number three, and that is mission. Let's read from verse 4. It says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
I remember when I finished college, because I kind of relate to this situation here. The disciples have been three and a half years with their Savior, learning, being trained, and I was at, at college for four years, and I remember I got to the end of preparing for ministry, and what, what happens is when you get a job, they send you out a little, a little um, envelope, and it has your, I guess, job assignment, what church you're going to go to, all that sort of thing wrapped up in there. And I remember getting the phone call and saying, come to the president's office in, at college, and I go up there, and I, and I say, here's an envelope, and it, you've been accepted a job, and here it is. And just to like, the excited, um, and like wondering, what, what is my job? What is my, my, my calling? What, where am I going to be going? What will I be doing for the next number of years? And opening that up and being very delighted that I'm, I was coming to Kingscliff Church. Now that same sort of excitement and anticipation the disciples would have had when they're meeting with Jesus, one of the last things he shared with them was their job description. Okay? And, and it says it there in verse 8, I can just imagine, it's like them reading this, this, this piece of paper, and they're just listening to Jesus. And he's saying, all right, this is your job, guys. This is what you are. I've trained you up. I've taught you. I've been an example to you. This is your job. And it says in verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What is a witness? Any ideas? A witness. You can call out some things. What, what is a... Tell what you've seen. Tell what you've seen. I like that. What was... Someone speaks to another person about Jesus. Fantastic. A teacher. Fantastic. I like what Leon said. It's sharing what, what you've seen in a, in a court, courtroom sort of situation. A witness is someone who's experienced something. It might be a crime or a car crash or whatever it is. And the witness gives their account of what had happened. A witness for Jesus is someone who has experienced the gospel. It's someone who's, who understands and has come to a, a real-life experience with the life, the death, and the resurrection of, of Jesus. And then they say, this has impacted me so much, I can't do anything else but share this. Now, it's interesting that the first place he told them to go to was Jerusalem. Okay, Why is that an unusual place to go back to, to start off with? It's where Jesus was killed. I like that. Yep. So Jerusalem was the place that murdered the Messiah. Okay, they were the Jewish leaders. And this this tells us something about the heart of Jesus. Okay. It makes me think of when Jesus on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They um, They put nails through his hands, through his feet. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. They beat him. They whipped him. And... At the end of that, after he died upon the cross and he's raised from the grave, and he says, all right, the first people I want you to go to is the very people who killed me. Okay, I think that's a powerful picture of God. And it tells us that, because often we think, oh, I've done this in my life, and oh, you don't realize the things that I've done, and, and God would never have me back. But the thing that this shows us that it doesn't matter who you are and what you've done, Jesus is wishing his salvation upon you still. And so their mission was to be, to, to take their experience, to take um, everything that they had witnessed and go and share that, not just in Jerusalem, but to the ends of the earth. Now, the next point is spirit. Now, this is a, when we go back to verse 4, there's a four-letter word that is something that really eager people probably don't want to hear. Okay? Verse 4 says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. In other words, not to jump into the work that he was calling them to do, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say. So before they were to jump into something, they were to wait. And wait for the Holy Spirit. I remember when I was a kid on Christmas morning, and there'd be all these gifts lying underneath the tree. And I would usually wake up at 6 a.m., and all the parents thought it was a good opportunity on Christmas morning to sleep in. But as a kid, that was not my idea at all. I was thinking, Christmas morning, presents, wake up as early as I possibly can, and let's race down there 
and open the presents. But we weren't allowed to open the presents until the parents and their laziness and their slumber just slept through the morning. And so we'd be there, and we had this same word, wait. Wait for the gifts. And we're just there and just eager to jump into it, but first we had to, to wait. And it's the same sort of thing that's happening, happening here. God, Jesus is saying, before you jump into action, you need to wait. Wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then it's the Holy Spirit will, who, who will enable you and qualify you for the task. So why do they need the Holy Spirit? Not I, but Christ in me. I like that. Anything else? They need power. Was the task a big task that Jesus had given them? Huge. Well, firstly, they were going back to the place where Jesus was crucified. Now, if they didn't like Jesus, chances are they're not going to like the people who are continuing preaching about Jesus. So they needed courage. They needed boldness. They needed power. And a second point is they were to begin at Jerusalem, and then they were to go to the ends of the, ends of the earth. Is that a fairly daunting sort of responsibility for 12 people? To say, Jesus says, I want you to be my witnesses. I want to take you to take this gospel, experience this gospel, go and share it in Jerusalem, but then to the ends of the earth. That is a bigger task than 12 people can do. That is a bigger task than the whole Christian church in the world can, can do by ourselves. And the third reason why it was too big for them is that there is an enemy, Satan, who was going to do everything he can to stop that work from taking place. There's a really, this is another little, we're going to give, I'm going to give you another little snapshot for, from future, um, a future part of Acts that we'll get to throughout the, the rest of the year, but I want to give you a snapshot of it. And it's in Acts chapter 19, and I really like this because this story, because it contrasts the difference between laboring for God with the Holy Spirit and laboring for God in your own strength. Okay? Now Paul, in this, section, in this part of the story, he was doing these incredible miracles. It even talks about how they would get one of Paul's handkerchiefs and they would go and just put it on a, on a sick person and that would be healed. And so Paul is going around, he's doing these amazing miracles and, and he's casting out um, evil spirits from people as well. And there's these seven people, they're called the, the sons of um, Sceva, and they think, wow, Paul is doing these amazing things. Let's try and do this ourselves. It's a little bit of a, maybe a scary story, but it really illustrates that point. It says, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits, they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. In other words, this name that Paul had been preaching about and, and doing miracles in the name of, they thought, let's try and cast out these evil spirits in the name of Jesus as well. They would say, in the name of, oh, they would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, Sceva a Jewish chief priest were doing this. But this is what happened. It says, One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Okay, that's a pretty scary statement. And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Pretty intense sort of story. But I love the story because it shows us the difference between laboring with the Holy Spirit and laboring without the Holy Spirit. And Paul had the Holy Spirit, and the disciples were to labor, and but God first said, wait. Our only chance to fulfill our calling is to first wait for the Spirit. So I've got there, wait, dot, 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 for the gift. Now, my last point is Elijah. And you might be wondering, what does Elijah have to do with this story? Okay. But Elijah has some real... The story of Elijah gives us some really cool little insights into what's happening here in the book of Acts. Now, let's, to start, off, let's, let's just start this, this, this part of the section, we're going to read, continue reading on from verse 9 through to verse 11. Okay. It says, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Is that a good promise? This is really the climax, I guess, of chapter 1. They're there, they go up to the Mount of Olives, 
with Jesus, and Jesus is lifted up from amongst them, and they get given the promise that Jesus is going to come again. And that's why we call ourselves Adventists. The word Advent means coming. Adventists is those who believe in the promise that is given here in Acts chapter 1, that Jesus is coming back again. Now, something that you might not be aware of is that the Mount of Olives is actually very close to the city of Jerusalem. When I was there, this was something that really stood out to me. I've got a picture for you of a couple of my friends on the Mount of Olives. Okay, you can see them there. They kind of look like they're floating in the air. This is the place where Jesus ascended up into heaven. Now, these guys were just kind of mid-jump when this took place. But this is kind of maybe what happened when Jesus ascended to heaven. He's just there on the Mount of Olives and was taken up into the sky. Now, one of the things that really stood out to me is, do you notice how close this is to Jerusalem? If you look behind there, uh, I think I've got a... That's, the, um, temp, that's where the temple was. And so there's a very real possibility that people from Jerusalem actually witnessed this. They looked out and they saw Jesus ascending into the clouds. Now, whether or not the people in Jerusalem did see Jesus, is, I guess, a little bit of speculation. But what we, is very clear from the text is that the disciples saw him leave. And this is going to be really important as we unpack the parallels with the story of Elijah. It says in verse 9, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and the cloud took them. So the disciples, they saw Jesus ascend into the, into the sky. Now let's jump into what I'm talking about with Elijah. Now Elijah was a great prophet of the Old Testament. He did incredible miracles. He raised the dead. He prayed and it stopped raining for three and a half years. Um, he, what was the other things he did? He called fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel. Incredible miracles that he, that he did. And at the end of his life, um, there's him and there's Elisha who he'd called to, um, to be his successor after him. And it says, Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up and struck the water with it and the water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed on dry ground. Is that a pretty amazing miracle? That's a miracle. And so Elijah is doing these incredible miracles and after he does this, it says, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken up? I am taken from you. Let, oh, what can I do before I am taken from you? And Elisha says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. What was the main thing on Elisha's heart when he knew Elijah was going? The spirit. He was saying, Elijah, the same spirit that's working these miracles in you, I want that spirit in my life. I want that spirit to live in me and to enable me to do the work that that I'm doing. It goes on. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, if, otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and, and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the the bank of the Jordan, he took the cloak that had fallen from, from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over it. Can you see the parallels? So Elijah's doing these incredible miracles, and he's about to be taken. And how was he taken? By the chariot. So he was taken up into the sky, very similar to a lot of parallels between, him, between Jesus. And, and the promise was that if you see him, you receive the Spirit. And so Elisha then sees Elijah taken to the sky and is equipped and is, and is given the promise that he's got the Spirit, goes down, strikes the water, and it parts. And we see that when he received the Spirit, the very same miracles that Elijah was performing, Elisha now performs. The work of Elijah is continued on in the, in the life of Elisha. The, the baton, like in a relay, is put in Elisha's hands, and powered by the same Spirit to do the same works and teach the same things. And so, this means that the apostles, the disciples, went through the exact same experience. And they were going to continue on the same work of Jesus, with the same Spirit of Jesus, to to write what we're calling the Acts and the Teachings of Jesus, Part 2. So, they're given the command to wait, but how did they wait? Did they just twiddle their thumbs? 
It says in verse 14 how they waited. It says, All these with one accord were devoting, notice that word devoting, some versions might have a different word there, but devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The way they waited was in prayer. They devoted themselves to each other, they devoted themselves to prayer, and if you read through the rest of the chapter, you see that they devoted themselves to the scriptures as well. And we're not going to unpack all the cool insights we could in the rest of the chapter. But basically, to summarize it, they're they're there, they're waiting, they're praying, they're together. And one of them is missing Judas, and they they seek God's guidance in replacing the apostle of Judas. Okay, so Acts, Gospel, Mission, Spirit, Elijah. Living it. How do we live this out? Okay, we've learned it. How do we apply this to our lives? And I've got for you three words to remember the living it section. Still... Stuff and stop. Okay, is that easy to remember? Still, stuff, and stop. But before I jump into this, I want for you to pull out... Did you get one of these little cards on the way in? If, some, if you didn't get one of these cards, can you raise your hand and the deacons are going to bring them around. One down the middle here. There's probably quite a number of you that didn't get one of these cards. So These are what we are calling connect cards. And the purpose of these is for us as a leadership team to be in connect, connected with everyone here in this church. And if you open them up, you see they're matched up with our series title here, Devoted. And we're going to have one of these every single weekend for this, for this series. Okay? You open it on and it has a spot for your name, email, phone, address. Then underneath that it has whether you're a first time guest, whether you're, you might be here for the very first time. If that's you, you'll tick the box there. You might be a visitor from another Seventh-day Adventist church. You might be a regular attender. If you've been here three times, you're a regular attender. Um, and it's about your age and that sort of thing there. So this is going to be important for as we go through this living it section. So we'll just make sure everyone gets one of these. Okay. Maybe a few more. They can keep handing those out as we start to unpack it. Now, the first word is still. And what do I mean by this? And that is the acts and teachings of Jesus are still being written today. The acts and teachings of Jesus, part one, what book is that? That's Luke. Okay. The acts and teachings of Jesus, part two, what book is that? Acts. Now, the very interesting thing is, when you begin Acts, it starts partway through the story. But when you end the book of Acts, um, Paul has just made it to Rome, and it doesn't even tell the end of the story. But it's kind of a cool way to finish, because it shows us that the story is ongoing. And it tells us that we continue to write the continuing volumes in the in the, the series of the Acts and the teachings of Jesus. Jesus has not faded into the background. He's not just a person who was alive that we celebrate who lived 2,000 years ago. Jesus is a person who lives today and he wants to continue to do the same miracles, the same teachings, the same great things by his spirit through his followers, which is us today. And so, look in your Connect card. If you look on the inside, on the right, the first question, and if you need a pen as well, they've, they've got some pens that are going around as well. The first question is, I understand that God's church has been called to continue the acts and teachings of Jesus today. Okay? So if that has been clear to you, that our role as a church is to continue what Jesus started 2,000 years ago by his Spirit, then tick that box there. So this is for everyone to, to fill in one of these. Um, that's number one. So still, the acts and teachings of Jesus are still being written today. Point number two. If you have the Spirit, you'll have the stuff. Okay? I love the the quote, the the, 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 I'm saying, God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. And if we think of the situation of of Peter, just think how slow he was. Okay? Jesus says, after I die, I'm going to, after three days, I'll rise again. The and he's like, okay, don't understand that. Then the, the, um, the women come, Jesus has risen. These people are speaking nonsense. Then he goes to the tomb and he sees there's no Jesus there. I wonder what happened. 
Okay. P- Peter was, a, was pretty slow sometimes. They were ordinary people. The, the, the apostles, the disciples, the early church were ordinary people. And sometimes they did terrible things. They made huge mistakes. They abandoned Jesus. They betrayed Jesus. They denied Jesus in, in those crucial moments. But yet, Jesus still called them. And we're discussing this in our small group. We're talking about how so often we try to come up with some, um, some reason why Jesus chose these people, some like inner deep quality, whether it was they had a real faith, and that's why Jesus chose them. But you read through the accounts, and so often they don't have that faith. Maybe they had a really good picture of what, who Jesus was. They stuff that up over and over again. Maybe they were selfless. Not really, okay? Maybe they were willing at times, but also no. And so when we go through, we realize that there actually wasn't anything that qualified the disciples to be called of God. The only thing that qualified them was Jesus. And the only thing that will qualify us for the mission that Jesus called us to is Jesus by his Spirit. And so if you have the Spirit, you'll have the stuff. So if you look at question number two, or statement number two, it is, Today, today's sermon has helped me understand that God can qualify even me for his work. And notice those words, even me. You might be sitting here and thinking, what am I going to do for God? But by God's Spirit, he can qualify even me for his work. Point number two. Point number three. The way to start is to stop. Okay. That seems so like contradictory. But we see this in the, what Jesus taught them. He said, wait. Before you run out, before you start, he said, stop. That is, so we start by stopping, and we, we stop and we wait by getting on our knees day by day, reading the Bible and in prayer, devoting ourselves to each other to prayer and the Bible study. And that is how we seek the Spirit. And when the Spirit fills us and qualifies us, we go out and we share that with the world. And so the third thing on there is, is a specific one. And it is, today I'm going to begin slash continue a daily Bible reading plan. Now, we're going to have these available for you as you leave the church today. They'll be somewhere at each of the doors. And um, basically, there's three options. Okay? If you're doing your own Bible reading plan and you're really enjoying that, just continue doing that. We just want people in the Word. It doesn't matter what book of the Bible you're reading. We want people in the Word. But we want to make this easy for you. So we've come up with three reading plans. The first one goes through the book of Acts and Luke, okay? So both volume and one of the, of the, the deeds and teachings of Jesus, and it alternates day by day through those books, and by the end of this sermon series, you would have studied through those two, okay? So that's the first one. The second one is, goes through the book of Acts and the book of John. Now, this, I've chosen this because I know there's at least one small group that's studying through John, and if, if you're a part of that small group, then I'd really encourage you to to pick up that, that reading plan, because that will take you through John, which you're studying in your small group, and Acts, which, you start, which you're learning here in the sermon series. The third one goes through Acts and the book of Romans. Now, remember we're talking about today how it was when they understood the gospel, that that is what really is where they understood the gospel, and then that motivated them to go out and spread that. When they realized how devoted Jesus was to them, they, realized, they started becoming devoted to him in return. So that one will unpack... Romans unpacks the gospel in a really thorough sort of way. So if you want to unpack Acts and Romans, grab that. And the different colors, just ask the person at the door. So if you would like to begin slash continue a daily reading plan, tick that box there. And you can pick that up on the way out. Now on the right side, now these ones won't change, and these will be, well, they might change occasionally, but mostly these will be there every time. And these are for people, you might be someone who's brand new to the church, this might be your first time here, and you know basically nothing about Jesus. But today you've said, wow, I've learned something about Jesus that I really want to, um, to learn more about. And if so if you would like information about becoming a follower of Jesus, tick that box. If you would like to be baptized, I'm sure there's, many, there's people here who, who, who've, who are committed to Jesus in their heart, and they know that they, they want to fully commit through baptism, then tick that box. If you would like to receive Bible studies, we've got our Bible workers here, and we're starting to get a bit of a team to go and give Bible studies. If you would like to receive Bible studies, tick that box. And finally, if you would like to be a leader, it's not just join a small group, if you'd like to be a leader of a small group, tick that and we'll be in contact with you about those sorts of things.